if this is the congregation of Yahweh content. And I, I am Pastor Lewis, and as you see Minister Lewis and you are, she will be giving me the remarks. I am Pastor Lewis, not my wife is Minister Lewis. All right? All right. Let's see. So I am Glenda Lewis. Yeshua said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though he died, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Amigo, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the teeth of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live. Uh, so, let me just take time off and to say on behalf of the congregation here in Canton, condolences to the family. I know this is a very hard time for you, but we now we give you the strength to carry on as we continue to celebrate the life of our dear brother. And it's in here. Bless his name. At this time, Minister Lewis is coming to officiate for us. Amen. Thank you. And shalom, good morning. Shalom. Everyone. I'm just going to invite you all to stand for a few minutes as we open with our congregation over here. How great thou art.
because his brother he cannot prepare himself no more. But we are alive today, Father, and we can make our wrongs right. And everyone that is in this building today, Father, Yahweh, that is not in the right position with you, may they make it right today, Father. We commit everything to you and take charge, Father. Oh, Yahweh, in your shoes, may I do it. Amen. Thank you, Deacon. At this time, we have a scripture reading by Althea Lavitt, a daughter, and it will be read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 to 58. Again, good morning, everyone. My name is Althea Anderson Levet. I am Joe's eldest daughter. Venice is my sister, his firstborn. And I know you don't have to think about that, but he never treated me different. Um, treated us the same. In fact, I thought I was his favorite. I know I'm supposed to read a scripture, but I would like to share a short memory. Um, I have many memories, from him walking me down the aisle to holding my firstborn son, who wasn't able to come with us today to be here. Um, I remember Dad always playing checkers with him. I think that was our game. Ben, did you play checkers with Dad? No, that was our game. But he would never let me win, and I was so upset. But I was, it made me determined. I was, the more I lost, the more determined I became to win. I even had dreams about playing him and winning him. And um, after having that actual first dream of winning him, I said, Dad, I'm ready to play you. I'm ready. And he said, yeah, you ready? Yes. And sure enough, I beat him on that right after that dream, but that taught me a lesson. It taught me determination and hard work. Winning doesn't come easy. It's not something that's given to you. It's something you have to work for and work hard at. And if you persevere, continue, pursue, you will achieve the goal. Amen. And I thank Dad for that lesson. Um, yeah. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 to 58. Fifty-one. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O grave, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Praise God. Feel free to cheer. It's a happy moment. If Uncle Joe's soul is in a good place, then we can, we can rejoice, right? Yes, wow. Yes. 
Um, thank you. I'm not sure if Lesma, Sister Lesma is here as yet. She's here? All right. We're going to have Sister Lesma this time doing the remembrance for us. And then, right after that, we have the second lesson by Sandlin Hepburn, granddaughter, from 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18, after Sister Lesma. So he sold the car. 
and he got he has two daughters. One Denise and Althea. Remember when he was going to Canada, he was leaving them with us. And I remember I said, don't let none of them reach age. Try your best. Take them out of my hands before they reach any age year old. And his dreams, my dreams has come through also. Eventually, he took them very early. When they were going to Canada, one was five and one was six. So my dream, seven, my dream has really come through because he did what I asked him for. I remember he bought me a ticket to Canada. I went to Canada, I got two weeks. So he had was to take me to the immigration two times per week. One day when we went to the, he take me to the immigration officer. The officer said to me, why do you leave your beautiful Jamaica and come to this coast country? I did not answer him. So he called, he called the airport and he said, do you have a flight for a deportee? I was, I was upset because he called me a deportee. My brother also looked at me and he gave me a smile. And I said to the man, after I realized that I asked him to come, and I looked at him and I said to him, and Mr. Paul, you have the authority to send me out of your country. Who have the authority to send you out of heaven? You can't reach there because you don't know authority to go there. No, no, no. No, no. And then you were coming home, my brother looked at me and he smiled. He looked at the side and he smiled. And he said, oh. He said, Alga, why did nobody know that my pet name was Alga? I think Derek knows. But he said, Alga, why you said that to the man? And he laughed. And I said, you tell him a bad word. And I said, I didn't tell him any bad word. And he said, yes. And he said, Victor, if you are telling one of these Jamaican words, he would not understand. And I looked at him on the side and I said, damn, you don't know Jamaican words. And he tell him that, Joe. Because he has power, you know, the power of this, so, and we have a big job, and we have a big job. So, yes. Yeah, I have to tell him because he has power too. But I didn't like that word. But, but I didn't like it either. What? What <laughs> was that? Hmm. So I said, I said, who's going to be towards the altar heaven? He was upset. And we both had a big law. I spent some good time with him in Canada. And I went also, I have another opportunity of going to America when he left Canada and he was living in America. And one of my niece was getting married. So we went to the wedding. On the way of going to the wedding, the way we went the day before, when we went there, that gate was closed. So he had us to use another road. He did not know that way. And so we started to drive, drive, drive. And I remember they said, follow the limousine. But maybe he was following the wrong limousine. And oh, the limousine no. turned that way. <laughs> and then he turned this way. So we got lost. Oh, no. And then I started to worry. And I said, Joe, when we reach the money go over, you know, I was sick. And he said, yes, I'm going to worry yourself to go reach on time. You can reach on time? No. You can reach on time. And the dust was coming down, and I said, I got afraid. And I said, Joe, look here. Park over that gas station. And he drove, and he parked at the gas station. And I said, call somebody. And he called Clyde. And Clyde said, Uncle Joe, where are you at? He said, I'm right at the gas station. Hold on, Uncle Joe. Don't move from the gas station, Uncle Joe. Stay right at the gas station. And then he came and he took us to the place where we were going. 
and we were there. Everything was finished, food, everything, they were dancing. But I just could not get upset with him. The love in my heart and the type of brother he was to me, I just could not be upset. And I started to laugh also. I know that he had the love of Yahweh in his heart. But before that, after we left there and we started to go home, I remember he said to me, don't fret, Alda. Don't fret. Don't fret, Alda. The wife can you go and see it. When I'll last you again, Alda, the Lord will bring you home. And I would not laugh, I would not say anything because I don't believe this man will last me again. But eventually, to say the But I remember one day he said to me, get dressed, and we are going someplace. So when I get dressed and I went outside, he said, we went to the mall. And he said, look inside there to see anything. And I looked, I didn't see anything. And I said, I don't see anything, I'm ready to go. And he said, then I'm done. Everybody come to America and go in the mall and see something. I you don't see nothing, I'm done. I'm done, you see so much clothes that you don't know which one to take up. And then you have a big job. And I said to him, you keep the money in your box. Because it's not by a gesture. But knowing him for who he was, he was a good man, a good friend. Words cannot express the type of person he was. Personal for me, he came behind me, and we were like, sometimes we were like two boys, and sometimes we were like girls. I would do everything that he does and the body behind. I would just do everything. And because of that, there's a relationship that really bond between me and Joe. No matter what, he would, I don't know if he can text, I just don't know. But sometimes you might look and you see the eye like a look, and he said, I want to, you know, and he would take a deep breath. But for that, I really missed him. And I remember he started the work in Paisley. And we were down by the bottom of Paisley and he visited us two times. But after we rented a little house from them and we were keeping church there, then we always did every stop. Sometimes we didn't see him, but we heard the walking stick. And sometimes the walking stick, the robot had dropped off and we would hear his knock and I think voice coming. But when we were to close down because of Corona, and we had to split. We said, so what are you going to do now? I said, you want to worship in Yardland or you want to worship in Kantek? But Kantek is closer. We said, oh, well, I hope he'll be sure. But every time that we went and visited him, he would ask me, when will you go build the church? When you go, so I realized in his heart, he wanted us to be a part of it. But as time changed, things changed. And started to pay. And I remember looking at him one day and I said, You don't look like Joe to me. And he laughed. And he said, Oh, you look older. He said, You don't look so like Joe again. But in spite of everything, I have lost a good brother. We have lost a good father. He was not a perfect son, but he was a good son. He was not a perfect brother, but he was a good brother. He was not a perfect father, but he was a good father. And he might not be a perfect husband or so, but he was a good husband. And so all of these things together, Joe was a good man. He was a good person. And because of that, he will always be in my heart and be in our heart. We will never forget him. Your spirit can have a look out and to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sandlin. I'm Joe's second granddaughter. And I will be reading 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that which we are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Praise Yahweh. If there's nowhere else we can find comfort, it's in the word of Yahweh. So as we hear these words, we will be find comfort. The family, the wife, and daughters in particular, may you draw on these words and these strengthens his name. At this time, we're going to have the offertory hymn, and we would like you all to join us as we sing, and in aid of our building, would like you to contribute to us considering this year. What a fellowship, what a joy to find. Can we stand and make this a lively time of singing?
the Father and the children give unto you, may you accept it, Yahweh. And Father, bless them continually in your service. Amen. Yes, and as we carry on, continue with the, our tributes at this time, we have Gary, Gary Lewis, otherwise known as Parky, the nephew. And in this order, we have Ezra Anderson, the brother of the deceased, and then friends and family. It will be open, and we see the limits, two minutes each. All right, so this time we'll have Gary, and in the, in the order, the others will come. Ezra, then friends and family will share. Sparky here. He's running, he's coming. All right, it's on all side. Just on time? Right here. There's a mic right there. You are Sparky? All right, there's a mic. Use that mic and just hold it. And share the tributes. Um, good morning, church, family and friends. Yes. I want to speak about my uncle. I'm late this morning. I'm sorry, I apologize for being late. We want to have Uncle Joe. Never I miss him. Affectionately known as Uncle Joe. Mm -hmm. And my memory go back as far as in the early 70s when we used to come here to my mother. And Uncle Joe, I think he was the only person, I, I the second person who had a carrying baby. So when he used to carry back, he used to feel real proud to most of my uncle back here. You know, man. <laughs> Now let's look up to him. One of the hardest working man we know. You know, man, I never disrespect him because he was a father figure to me. Both him and Uncle Ezra. And during the seventies when he visited, I gave two dollars when I said, you know, two dollars for Uncle Joe. But after 1989 when we migrate, I'm going to Florida. I go to Thursday and Friday. He come, he come up to my yard and ask me, say, Look at this up, Tell him, say, well, I don't know, you know. Carry me out of the supermarket again, extra. And he take up a gallon of milk. Me never want to take it, because I first can see a gallon of milk. Because <laughs> <laughs> then he has a little bit, so look at the maximum milk I can make. And he buy, he buy a portion of food. They have two bags, two of the extra bags. And he give me $50. He send me $50 for me to give him the money. The first $50 I gave to America. Uncle Joe gave me. And one, after, now we just close to him, buy a bicycle and leave him in a ride go back now. And when we left on construction in 1990, if me, if we go late, if him did not work on a, the ramp, we had work on a big incinerator. So me, me the work with the captain, but not after passing, so if we go late, we have to hide him, because he said, somebody he said, Joseph is parking there. <laughs> You know, I rip and I come over my eyes and rush down and tell my mother. So my mother and I saw me a bird in my hand. I'm going to leave for her. And over the years, one time I worked with a company named Big Supply, building scaffold. The scaffold was one of the hardest working I work. Work the one week I leave the job, but we couldn't manage it. <laughs> and I see Uncle Joe work on a job for years. Years in America, I did see. I mean, I always look up to him, man. I always have him as a success story, so I always have a level of respect. You know, so even when we make some bad decisions, I go to the ice cream, the man always talk and I said, Why do you not think you have what I want already? He love it, no? And when we come back to Jamaica, I mean, I raise him and I see him and encourage him. And he was close, very, very close to my heart. A man I mean, have respect for him. Admiration. I was the last person to see him in the hospital. I was here in the hospital. I was looking for him and I see him and I tried to talk to him. But he never really attacked him. He was like grown back to me. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't. The man who I knew and I respect over here is like a father figure. I couldn't stand to see him in that position. 
And let me start to go my vulnerability as a human being, as a man, and say, well, all I will walk the road there. And we pray to God, that's my uncle, make it right with God. Because all in life, he work hard, and he work lawfully, and he live right. And who would like to know, say, not him, he never make him, himself right with God. Because all we that say, no, we don't, we don't face our judgment. And the Bible said, I'm on the bar one time. We have to be dead after it comes to judgment. So, all that we have to look for our vulnerability and our mortality, knowing that one day we will die down with our life unto death. No care how hard or how soft or how bad or how good 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 after that comes to judgment. So, my, my uncle, the Pope, he was a very, very good man, a very hard worker, disciplined. So, this can testify to life. So, we just spoke to God, sleep in peace, and we make it right with God. Amen. And amen.
don't know that I may always tell him, say, I love singing, but I'm not a good singer. And he always said, do what you can do. So, I don't know, listen to the voice, because I have a little post voice. So, I don't know, listen to the voice, just listen to the words.
a Cambodian friend that wants to come? Or we just go by home? This time we have a selection by Carlos Watson, a friend. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm more than a friend. It's my hundred person. Um, I'm singing for my hundred. He's gone already, so that we feel up to his ear as they can have courage to move on. When I'm done, So weary when troubles come and my heart burns me. I 
On Sunday, February the 25th, 2024, Neville Herbert Anderson, a loving husband, father, grandfather, brother, and uncle passed away at the age of 81 years old. Everyone knew him as Joe. He was born on December the 28th, 1942. At least that's what it says on his birth certificate. I've been told by his older sister that that was not his actual birthday. And as a child, I recall celebrating his birthday on November 15th. He was born in Paisley, St. James, to parents Lillian Clark and Caleb Anderson, who had a total of 13 children. In his 30s, Joe migrated from Jamaica to live in Canada. He lived there for approximately 10 years with his first wife and his two children. In 1984, he moved to Florida, where he lived until he retired in 2005. At that time, he decided to move back to Jamaica. Prior to leaving the States, he got baptized and gave his life to the Lord. In his lifetime, Joe had several occupations. He worked as a waiter, store clerk, and driver in Jamaica. In Canada, he worked the assembly line making parts for automobiles. Before he retired, he built scaffolds on construction sites. Joe liked to have his own things, and to do so, he had to save. He was considered frugal in his spending because his goal was to own land for farming. So when he retired, that is what he did. He grew his own food and raised animals like goats and cows. He loved to farm. It was surprising to me when I visited him after he had moved back back that he had several kittens running around his house and he had names for them. Before that, I would never have guessed that my dad even liked kittens. My dad was very loyal to his family and he was in turn loved by his siblings, nieces and nephews, along with his wife, children, and grandchildren. He is survived by his wife, Nellie, daughters Althea and Venice, and grandchildren Mario, Pejame, Sandlin, and Faith. He is survived by his siblings, Ezra, Clinton, Almina, Lesma, and Ozzy. So now, let me share some of my memories with my dad. In my youth, I remembered him as a tall and handsome man who was respected and had a lot of friends. He was the center of any gathering, and he always made people laugh. He enjoyed laughing, even though some of his jokes were corny. My sister laughed at those. Although Dad liked to socialize, he liked his quiet moments, too. He was always generous with food, and he would cook really good but he liked to tease. I remember him cooking prairie chicken one time, and it was especially spicy. I asked him, why'd you make it so hot? And he told me, so you wouldn't eat too much and get fat. Daddy was a money manager, which is another way of saying he was cheap. I was tall for my age, and my toes would often break through my sneakers as I went through my growth spurts. I recall telling my dad I needed new sneakers again. He brought home the ugliest brown work boots that looked like sneakers. They had steel in the toes. After all, they were protective work boots that he took that he wanted me to take to school as my gym shoes. And he said, let's see if your toes can get through that. <laughs> he was protective of his daughters, and we were never allowed to go to anyone's house 
and definitely never slept the night, or spent the night. I remember as a child in Canada, I told him a boy was looking under my dress at school. And we were of faith, so we didn't believe in wearing pants. Daddy told my mom to go, to go buy us some pants from now on. Daddy wasn't a very demonstrative guy, and he did not often share his emotions. Until I was 10 years old, I had never heard my father say the words, I love you. But when I had surgery to take out my adenoids and was left in the hospital for a night, he said the words, I love you, as he was getting ready to go. As an adult, I heard it more often when we left him or ended our calls. And he always said it to his granddaughters. I often got scolded because he felt I didn't bring them by to see him enough or call him enough. Old age made him more expressive. Daddy was a stubborn man. I think his stubbornness increased after his stroke. One day, I took the girls to see him at the rehab facility where he was staying. It appeared he had been complaining about the food previously. The nurse came by that day to check specifically if his food was better. Now daddy had cleaned his plate. I expected him to say it was good or better. Instead he said, me eat it. The girls and I laughed so hard, and that remains a fond memory they have of their grandfather. We'd walk around the house when we talk about daddy. Daddy was married to Nellie for over 34 years, and she doted on him. After his stroke, she did everything for him. Nellie, I want to take this opportunity to thank you from the bottom of my heart for loving my father. And taking care of him. Thank you. Thank you, this is Edward. All right, we now have a selection by P.J. Lavitt, Sandy Lynn Hepburn, and Kate Hepburn from Notice.
First of all, I'd like to offer my condolences to the family of Uncle Joe or Neville Anderson, to all those who are mourning, and I speak on behalf of myself and the congregation of Yahweh, to which he was associated in the district of Paisley. I I'm not sure in my recollections because I visited Paisley very few times in the course of my ministry and I might have met him once or twice. But let me say he was not a person to which I was deeply acquainted uh, because, like I said, I did not go to Paisley too often. I have more on the other, on the other side. But nevertheless, listening to the the words that have been expressed and the sentiments that have been spoken by various ones I sort of paints a picture of his character and the kind of person that he was and I get the understanding that in the latter years, in the latter times, he became a, a person of faith and uh, having committed his life to the Saviour and all that makes me joyful, it makes me glad. And I'm glad to see here today those who love him, who cherish him, and who have come to celebrate a life which is lived. And uh, if I may add, can you do something about the um, echo on the microphone? And if I may add also those who have a hope of eternal life. This afternoon, I think it's the desire in everyone's heart to live forever. Isn't that so? I don't think there is any mad world. There is no queuing up at the gates of death. Everybody wants to live a life. But not just live, I think, persons want also a life of quality. Because suppose you were to live long, and yet you didn't have a good quality of life. It can be very miserable, can't it? You know that from time immemorial, man has been seeking for immortality. Immortality. And the scripture speaks a little bit about immortality. 
I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44, speaking about the body, says, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body, there is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So that tells us that what we see with our eyes isn't all that there is. And what we experience in this life, because we all live in a natural body, and living in that natural body, it is susceptible to certain ailments and sickness and weakness, and in due time, that body, because of sin, will eventually return to the dust from whence it came. But man has always had in his heart a sense of wanting to live on and on in immortality. In ancient times, the Chinese believed that there was a certain mushroom that could be used to gain immortality. And the emperors of old would send men to seek for this supernatural mushroom. It was never found because immortality it does not dwell in a mushroom. And I get thinking when I read about this, you know, if I was one of those who were sent to find that mushroom, Perhaps I would have eaten it all before I came back home. <laughs> Ancient Greeks, they believed that there was a certain drink, an elixir, they call it, that if they were to drink of that cup, it would give them immortality. And that tells us that within humanity, there is this desire, there is this longing, Deep down, we desire immortality. And I believe it is because when we were originally made, Yahweh had it planned that man would continue to live if only he would eat of the tree of life. Yes. Man, we know, failed in that business. And having failed, he died. In fact, he died first inwardly spiritually because his connection of fellowship with the Almighty was somewhat cut off. And then later on, that which was within him began to work on his externals, and in due time he died physically. But man, in those days, because of his nearness to the Almighty, they would live for hundreds of years. But over the centuries, as sin has prevailed, the days of man have become shorter and shorter until now it's, you can hardly predict, it's a good thing when a person sees a hundred. Oftentimes people say it's supposed to be three score and ten, and if by reason of strength you make it to eight, eight you think you've done well. Um, let me just add here that three score and ten and eighty are not the years that the scripture prescribes. In actual fact, because people live for 90, 100, 120 years, I remember some um, about a few years ago when the, the oldest woman in the world, uh, Miss uh, Violet, was a brown in Duan's Vale, when she, I think she reached the age of 115, 116. And I remember when it was when when the oldest person who was in another country died, she was officially the oldest person in the world. And I remember I went to her home, I was living about four miles away, and that day the Governor General was visited from Kingston because he came to congratulate her uh, at her reaching that significant milestone of being the oldest person in the whole world. And she held that record for about two years or so until something interrupted. And I remember the Governor General presented her with a, a huge portrait of himself. And when she looked at his portrait to show how right she was, she said, she, he asked her if she liked the picture, and said, 
Yeah, but I brought the real thing. Uh, so she was not, her, all her marbles were in place. She could think and she could reason, her sight, she could see and she could hear, and so on. Man has done research and he is working on what they call nano robots. And nano robots are tiny little mechanical things that can be put into the body, you have to see them with a microscope. And they can be injected or supposed to be injected into the body. And these tiny little robots are supposed to swim around in the body and correct any defects that are in the body, any defects that may lead to any kind of disease and sickness. That is what man is trying to do. I'm going to announce from now he's not going to succeed. Man is going to fail. They call it transhumanism. There is a difference between immortality and eternal life. Though we speak of them as the same, there is actually a difference between immortality and eternal life. We we'll read in Romans 2 verse 7, that to the saints, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for dignity and honor, immortality and everlasting life. The term immortality means that you're never dying. Life will never be extinguished. But it speaks more of the, uh, of the equality of your life, whereby everlasting speaks more of the length of your life. And both go together. Because if you have everlasting life, and you didn't have a good quality life, you'd be, it'd be terrible absolute misery. In fact, when man sinned and he was put out of the garden, the Almighty put two cherubims of the garden. The garden the gate wide. Lest man should go back into the garden and do what? Eat of the tree of life and live forever in his sinful condition. Can you imagine what the state of the world would be? If Man could live forever in his, his sinfulness. It was it's almost unimaginable. And uh, the Almighty decided to put an end to that. Man would equal the devil himself. Because there's no history of the devil ever died. Even in hell, he's going to be alive. So he's got an everlasting life in a way, but the quality of life is going to be totally different. Praise his name. The scripture says in John 17 verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true mighty one, Elohim, and Yeshua, that is Jesus, the Messiah whom thou hast sent. This is life eternal, the scripture says. It is to come into an acquaintance with the Almighty Himself and with His Son. That is the beginning of our journey to immortality. The scripture says in the well-known, often repeated scripture in John 3, 16, For Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should what? Not perish, have but have everlasting life. Remember years ago they used to sing this in the chorus, Anybody here wants to live forever? Say, I do. Remember that chorus? Well, here the scripture has opened the door and gives shown the path and the gateway to everlasting life. At this moment, it does not promise everlasting life while we dwell in this body because the scripture says we dwell in a perishable body. A perishable body. 
a body that is prone to sickness, to aches and pains, to diseases. And I have bad news for some of you. It doesn't matter what you do. You can eat healthy. You can exercise all you want. You can prolong your days by looking after your body and looking after yourself. But sooner or later, sooner or later, death will come knocking. Doesn't matter what you do, he will come knocking. So I would counsel you to do what you can. Eat right, sleep well, exercise. But having said all that, one day, one day, it is appointed unto men once to die. And that appointment is one that you must keep. I must keep. We cannot escape it no matter what we do. We see the, the machinations of man and they work, they're working on things like they, when people are terminally ill, they'll put them in a, in, a, in a kind of freezing compartment where they just before they die, they put them into a crypto freeze that instantly freezes all their members with the, with the idea that years down the road, when they find a cure for that disease that they die of, they would thaw them out. And when they thaw them out, they would inject them and give them that medicine or what, so that they can live on some more. This is the kind of things that people are getting up to. I don't know what they're going to have to do when, the, when there's a power cut <laughs> and the freezer. <laughs> And the freezer gets switched out. I don't know what plan they have for that. Hallelujah. But the scriptures give an answer. This is life eternal. It's saying all that man seeks after and searches after, if he can get acquainted with the Almighty and with his Son, he will receive eternal life as a gift. As a gift, you can't work for it, you can't strive for it, you can't fight for it, but it becomes freely through the knowledge of the Almighty and through accepting His Son as your own personal Savior. And the one who cannot lie has left it on record that every soul, everyone sitting here can enjoy and know eternal life. Now you may say that sounds too fantastic to be true. That sounds like we're going to fantasy land. That sounds like we're dreaming. The Bible says, let Yahweh be true, let him not lie. If he has said it, and it's available, in him there is no darkness, no variableness of turning, Savior said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, if you put your faith in me, you will never die. He that believeth in me, he says, will what? Never die. Obviously, he was not talking about this outer man, because if this outer man is mortal. But he said, even when you die, you merely sleep until the time when the trumpet shall sound and all the dead of the Messiah will be raised first. Hallelujah. What a thing to contemplate. There is eternity in our hearts and that is gift is available through His Son. The subject of eternal life is a dominant one in the New Testament. And it comes under certain conditions. Scripture says this is the promise that he has promised us even eternal life. This is the promise that he has promised us 
Eve, the eternal life, and that is found in Long John chapter 225. Do you like receiving gifts? Do you like receiving gifts? Yeah. Think about the best gift you have ever had in this world. Our appreciation and our sense of valuation where gifts are concerned is really dependent upon our age. When you are a child, you appreciate childish things. You may appreciate a bicycle, a pair of shoes, a cell phone, and that sort of thing. As you get older, you begin to appreciate bigger things and greater things. When you become, at the age you want to marry, the Bible says, he that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. And if you get a good wife, you've got a good gift. Is that so? Amen. Uh, I'm not speaking to everybody here, but if you have. <laughs> and some people may, you may receive a house as a gift. You may receive land bequeathed to you. You may receive a brand new car. All its gifts, you didn't pay for it. But let me tell you, you can only enjoy those things for a season. And after a while, even though they're given as a gift, the heart is still yearning for something more. More. Because if you're given land, you're going to have to pay tax on the land. If you're given a car, you have to put gas in it, and you have to spend to maintain it. And no matter what you get in this world, somehow down the road, it's still costing you something. But there is a gift that came from above that only the Almighty can give because it is part and parcel of his character, his person. He is immortal, immortal, invisible, only wise, and he's able to impart through his son a gift to everyone of value, whether you are young, whether you are old. An old man once asked the question, how can a man be born when he's old? He asked a question when he was told, you have to be born again. How can a man be born when he's old? And he was given the answer, you have to be born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Hallelujah. I wonder today how many persons have availed themselves of that free gift. Nearly every day at some place in the island of Jamaica, you will see persons queuing up with a little ticket or with some cash in their pocket. And they have a few numbers in their head or numbers that they have written down. And on these, you know, these numbers, they're hoping that this ticket they have will be a ticket to their dreams. And sometimes they dream something and they see a broom. And they ask them, neighbor, oh, what did you see a broom last night? What do you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, number 25, you see five black dogs. What do that mean? That means so and so and so. You see, a pregnant woman, what I mean. And they think that somehow if they were to put together all these mysterious numbers, that sooner or later they're going to get strike it rich and they will become multi-millionaires. And in their mind's eye, to them, that is the setting. That is the peak of their ambition to have everything that their heart could in the form of dollars so they can buy anything that they want. I remember a story. One 
lady who actually hit it big. She hit the jackpot. Multiple millions. And she was on an aircraft enjoying her easy wealth. And she took sick and died in that airplane. And she left everything behind. What value was that such a gift? If you were to be given millions beyond your imagination, it might outlast you. But you gotta go one day. But hallelujah, there is a gift that is without money, without price. For the scripture says, come buy, come and buy without money and without price. That gift, the Almighty gives, is eternal life, everlasting life. Let me say, right now, in our bodies, outside of the knowledge of His Son, death is working. Death is working. Death is working. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. And one day, every one of us must die. And after death is the judgment and we must stand before our maker and give an account of everything that we have done in this body. And if we have not found his son during our lifetime, then there is a certain looking forward of judgment and destruction. So his word teaches us. We have to take the good and the bad. Hallelujah. If he promises us eternal life, he also promises eternal damnation to those who do not reach forth and take a hold of that life. Yeah. It's one or the other. There is no middle road. There are some who feel that when they die, that is the end of everything. They feel when you leave this world and the body returns to the dust from whence it was taken, that's the end of everything. It is not the end. It is not the end. One day, one day, every dead person is going to die. Everyone, good or bad, not in the, together because the scripture speaks about the first resurrection. Yes, sir. Said, Blessed and holy is he that hath a part in the first resurrection. Yes. When the trumpet sounds, all the righteous who are in their graves will be raised. Right. But they shall be changed, the scripture said. This mortality shall be put off, and we shall have immortality. God, death will be swallowed up in victory. Praise his name. Yes. This is the hope that the righteous have. It is not an empty pipe dream. It is real because he who made the universe has promised it thus. Yes. But there is coming a time when one, the revelator say, he saw the dead both small and great. The sea gave up its dead. Death gave up the dead. Everywhere gave up the dead. And they all stood before the Almighty and the books were open. And whoever was not found in the book of life was cast into a lake of fire. Praise his name. Hallelujah. So then, what shall I do? What shall I do? Two paths before me, the Almighty said to the children of Israel in long ago, he says, I set before you life or death. Yeah. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life. Some may say, I will choose when I'm a little older, when I've lived my life in this world. It is a funny thing, you know. The longer you live, the more comfortable you become in this world. The more the enemy deceives and fools you, the more fast he holds you. There are some who think that they can repent on their deathbed. You know that there are many who think, on my deathbed as I lay and die, I will repent and Slip into the kingdom just like that. I've been, I've visited many sick people and I've seen people dying on their deathbed. And in some cases, they can't even talk to me. Even if I wanted to talk to them, 
In some cases, I don't even know if they can hear me. I remember one who was dying, and they, I was overseas, and they gave me a telephone, and they put it on speaker and put it near to his ears. He couldn't respond, but I could talk to him, and he could hear what I'm saying. I can only hope that he hears. And if he hears, I don't know of his cognitive abilities, what he can do. You see, it's a risky business. Somebody has once said that those who plan to repent at 11.30 die at 11 o'clock. Praise his name. Hallelujah. We have to use the opportunity that is given to us for the Bible says now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. We're not given tomorrow. There is no respect of our age. There is no respect of our wealthy, how wealthy we are. When the time comes, it just comes. And so it behoves every one of us to reach forth in faith and look to the one who the Father has sent, who said, put your trust in me. Whoever believes in me shall not enter into death. He shall receive life. Life is a gift. Praise his name. Amen. I'm wrapping up because time is going. Amen. But you are the living. You are the one that I have to speak to. The dead is already gone. It's important for those who still like to hear the word. Because one day there will be a gathering like this, as we have heard. And we won't be there at least not in spirit. The body might be there, but not in spirit. It doesn't matter then what is said, good or bad. It does not matter, because there where the tree lies, there is the way. So today I use this opportunity to sound the message of this hour to remind us of our personal responsibility to ourselves and that there is an offer of life that is still valid for every soul, everyone. So he says, look unto me and be saved on the ends of the earth. Look and live. Turn aside, the scripture tells us. Turn aside from sin. Turn aside from wickedness. Turn aside from self-righteousness. Do not trust in your own self as if you can save yourself. Come as a sinner that says, Thou will have mercy upon me. I say, Have mercy upon me. They that come unto me, he says, I will be no wise. No wise. That's not. But in sincerity and faith, he who tries the heart knows what is the thought and the intent. And coming to him, he offers forgiveness and peace. And he offers his spirit, which has eternal life embedded therein. Right now, right now, you can have eternal life. Not when you awake in resurrection. Right now, you can have life. For the scripture says, he that hath the Son, hath life. He that hath not the Son, hath not life. So eternal life can be residing within us. And it doesn't matter what happens to this body. When we die, the spirit returns to him that gave it. But hallelujah, that eternal life that is in his son. He given us a gift. And right now we walk by faith. And not by sight. I close. Saying, now is it such a good time. Today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow may be of a different mind. You're taken up with this and that. You don't have time. You don't have time to pray. You don't have time to seek schedules to meet. Busyness of life. Sometimes it's not until we are, we, we are on a sick bed that we begin to think seriously about our lives. Or when we are in, see some tragedy, then we begin to seriously contemplate what life is all about. 
But right now, while we are in consciousness, while we are able to think clearly, that's the ideal time for us to make inward decisions and choices for life, for eternal life. Lord, be assured the Messiah has already been shaped for forgiveness and correction of every other sin. It has already been done. You can only enter into something that has been done. It's nothing more that you can do. You can only receive what has been done. Hallelujah. Praise His name. May this be the day of salvation for some as they make their choice. This time, I want to say a prayer for the entire family. I'm asking, I'm going to do things a little different. I'm going to ask the family to stand and everybody else to sit. Usually I want the family to sit and everybody stand. But I want the family to stand because I want to pray for them. And uh, you can all, the audience can also join in the prayer as you pray for them. The family members will relate to this. Let us just bow our heads a moment. Gracious Father, this afternoon as we stand here in your presence, for some it could be the threshold between life with you and death. We know not what tomorrow may bring. But we thank you for this opportunity that you have presented to us. That one more time we may hear your voice, we may hear your words. I pray for every family member that is standing this afternoon. For those who have made their choice and have chosen life, we pray that you will strengthen and keep them and help them to endure even to the very end. We pray for those who are in the valley of decision that you will hasten the day and cause faith to spring up in their hearts that they may choose life. We pray for those who are cold and indifferent and those who do not see the necessity may you awaken within them a desire Waken within them a faith, a trust in you as to the reality of the matters pertaining to life and death and spiritualness and the kingdom of Yahweh. Waken those who are asleep. Dispel those who are in doubt. And let there be in their hearts a hungry and a thirst in for your righteousness. I pray for everyone that you will cause them and lead them in contact with people and persons and situations that will bring them to the place of utmost surrender to you. I pray also for those who are in deep mourning today because of the loss of a loved one, family member. Continue to be their strength and their comfort and their guide and see them through the troublesome days that are ahead. I pray that the vacuum that exists within their souls, that emptiness will in due time be filled and that they will entertain our hope because of the decisions that they have made for life, that they may entertain our hope for eternity. Father, I pray for everyone, young, old, and different wherever they may be, that you will prevail upon them by your grace. And they will be blessed with the gift that you sent your Son to bestow upon those who have put their trust in Him. This evening, cover each and every one. May your blessing rest upon every soul present here. We ask in the name of your Son, and the Son of God. Amen.
instructions for to internment. I think this is at Paisley. We go back to Paisley for internment. Yes, I can find the And so at this time, we're going to ask, invite you to stand as you sing your session again. When peace like a river. When peace like a river